a snapshot in history, winning the vote for American women. Hello, I'm William Beaudry, a magistrate of Cleveland Municipal Court since 2001, and now a candidate for judge in the Court of Common Pleas of Cuyahoga County in the May 8, 2018 Democratic primary. I'd like to talk to you today about how women won the right to vote in the United States. The earliest known protest by an American woman against the denial of her right to vote was in 1647, over a century before there even was a United States, by a woman named Margaret Brent, who objected to being denied a voice and a place in the politics of Maryland. The all-male Maryland Assembly rejected her request. When our country was founded in 1776, most of the original 13 colonies limited the right to vote to white men who owned land or other property. Over time, property limitations were scaled back or dropped in many states, but people of color and women of all races were still denied the right to vote. It wasn't until after the Civil War that the United States Constitution was amended or changed to allow more people to vote. The 15th Amendment ratified in 1870 provided that the rights of citizens to vote shall not be denied on account of race, color, or the fact that that person might earlier have been enslaved. But just about everyone at the time thought that these rights were for men only. That was how it had always been, and that was just how many men wanted it to remain. Before the beginning of the Civil War in 1861, many women became involved in the abolitionist movement, striving to abolish slavery. They were an important part of the Underground Railroad, a secret organization that helped slaves escape into freedom. They saw that slavery was cruel and wrong, but that it was protected by law. In the same way, they came to see that women were limited in what they could do by the law. Clearly, the law had to change. Brave women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone, and many others, having helped win freedom for slaves, shifted their work after the Civil War towards winning votes for women, all women. Stone, who I'm proud to say was a graduate of my own school, Oberlin College, and others who wrote letters and articles, lobby government leaders, gave speeches, and did their very best to open the nation's eyes to the injustice, the unfairness of depriving one half of the population the right to help choose the leaders of towns, cities, states, and the nation itself. As historian Jean H. Baker wrote, voting became the central means by which women could achieve improvements in their status, including owning property, managing their own money, working outside the home, getting college educations, and entering professions such as law and medicine, which had long been closed to them. Many people were hostile to these goals, including even some women. Many thought that men ought to always be in charge, that women were unsuited to involvement in politics, or that women ought to simply remain quietly at home and focus entirely on family life. But Stanton and the others made progress, real progress. In 1869, in part through the leadership of Esther Morris, the Wyoming Territory allowed women to vote in all state and local elections. Three other western states, Colorado, Utah, and Idaho, later did the same. Then things seemed to stall. Susan B. Anthony, age 86, told younger women at a convention in Baltimore, the fight must not cease. You must see that it does not stop. The younger suffragists, that is, women striving to win suffrage or the right to vote, kept at it, and they made some progress. Washington State, California, Kansas, and Oregon joined the earlier states in extending the right to vote to women. By 1917, 16 states had done so, including New York State. By the time the U.S. entered World War I and helped win that conflict, it was clear that women had a more vital role to play in American society than ever before. They did the work of men who'd been drafted to serve in the military, and they did it well. Carrie Chapman Catt, Alice Paul, Lucy Burns, Harriet Stanton Blatch, and many others, a new generation of suffragist leaders, argued that it was long past time that women should be given the right to vote. They took a more direct approach than in the past. They picketed the White House, they allowed themselves to be arrested and jailed, and they even went on hunger strikes. Some of them were brutalized by police and by jailers. After initially being opposed, President Woodrow Wilson eventually came out in favor of the Susan B. Anthony Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Women and their many male allies worked across the country to get it passed. It came down to Tennessee, where the all-male legislature approved the amendment by a margin of just two votes. One, Harry Byrne, a young state representative, was expected to vote against the amendment, but he voted yes after he got a letter from his mother, Fed Ensminger Byrne. She wrote, hurrah, and vote for suffrage. Don't keep him in doubt. I've been watching to see how you stood, but have not noticed anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy. With lots of love, Mama. 
Asked to explain his change of heart later, Byrne said, I know that a mother's advice is always safest for a boy to follow. In just over a year, Congress and the 36 necessary states had ratified the measure, which became the 19th Amendment. Women had won, and that meant that the whole country had won. Women first voted for president across the country in the election of 1920, and they have in all elections at all levels of government and in every state since then. Carrie Chapman Catt said something I believe we should remember still. Women have suffered an agony of soul that you and your daughters might inherit political freedom. That vote has been costly. Prize it. I'm William Beaudry Cannon for Judge of the Court of Common Pleas. I hope you will prize your rights as a citizen and learn about the candidates this year and every year and be sure to vote.